So now that we have the red ball in hand, let's go back to Miniandus' place and use it there. We'll come back here later once we have that pentagon thing, but for now we're just going to leave this place be. And we'll do our usual rail switching trick here to get back to the north place. One thing I gotta say is that I really appreciate just how much the environments that um, make up these different side paths are different. Like, that is kinda cool. At least it helps you differentiate between all three of them. Well, four of them, I guess, counting the south side where we originated. Alright, so we want to close off the west side and open up the north side. So I'm going to go north here and then I'm going to go through the east side to cross over into the west side. Since we can access that ladder from right here in the tower. The problem with this whole section of the game is that there are so many things that require backtracking uh, in terms of getting an area, getting something in one area and then going to another area where you'll then get something that you're using in another spot. I mean, this happens quite a bit, and if I'm not mistaken, the route I'm taking is pretty much as optimal as we can get. Um, there may be like one or two trips you may be able to save, but I don't think so. Um, yeah, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't really think there is any way to save any time. But it, it's kind of one of the more awkward things about doing a Let's Play of a game like this, is that I want to show how you logically arrive at decisions, but I don't really want to take, like, ridiculous gobs of time to, say, like, wait for all those flowers um, on that clock thing where they change color and all that. I mean, who would want to watch a Let's Play where we just stand there for forever? I mean, that would be no fun. So, I mean, it's things like that that I just really don't want to have to worry about. And I'm sure you guys can understand that. I mean, it's... I, I know it's not exactly the most ideal situation, but that is just pretty much the way the game is designed. I think what makes this game a little bit tougher than some of its uh, predecessors, Rem 2 notwithstanding, just mainly because of its scope, um, is that it is just kind of a little bit filled with more leaps in logic that you have to make. And we're going to be seeing more of those here in the next uh, few episodes. Anyway, um, let's go over here to the side path, and I'm going to go ahead and put the ball in the slot. Alright. And it made the bridge rise. This is kind of interesting because this bridge has a pedestal thing that it's on that's also round, like the rotating one, but this one doesn't rotate. So, that is kind of a little bit of of a bummer, but, well, I guess it wouldn't really uh, do any good since there's really nothing over there. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and just close that door because I happen to know that this opens another door, like an airlock, and uh, I want that particular one to be open first. It doesn't actually matter, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it in this order. We've got a diagram here, or drawing thing here of a square with a diagonal line going through it from the northwest and then going down. Now this may seem kind of a little bit unfamiliar, but keep in mind back in the east area we saw that panel that had the four squares with lines coming out of them or into them. And there were four different things, two of which were on the outside and two of which were on the inside. So if we were to make one contiguous image out of all the squares that were the correct answer, it would probably look something like this. So next time we're over there, we're going to have to try this out. Over here, we've got another drawing, and this one shows 12 different squares, and each of them is connected to a circle. Now, this may look, again, rather unfamiliar, but see where all these dots are placed? These are placed at clock positions, starting at 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and so forth. And in case you've forgotten where we've seen a clock like that before, well, just look over here. We got a vase of flowers that look remarkably similar to the ones that were there sitting by that clock that changed colors. Except these ones don't change colors at all. And what's this thing? Well, this definitely looks familiar. It's a triangle, like the one we saw in the silo area with the three circles outside of it. 
And that was the symbol that we saw connected to that three-digit combination lock on the outside of the area on the way in. But for some reason, this drawing of the triangle in the circles is superimposed atop a picture of... Well, it seems to be something here. In fact, it seems to be this thing. Do we press the button? Nothing happened. Huh. So we have a choice here. We can go either here or in here. And um, if you follow these wires, you'll see that they go both back to the button that we pressed there earlier that closed this door. And that's why this one opens up at the same time this one closes. And this leads back out here. So now we can just go around and make a loop. Well, you know what they say about loops in REM. If you can adjust something after you complete the circuits, you might want to try that. In this case, I'm going to lower that bridge, since that bridge is directly adjacent to that uh, button that we pressed that did nothing. So maybe if it's down, something different will happen. Again, this is something that I couldn't really quite figure out on my own. It's just one of those things that you wouldn't really think of, but... I mean, if you've been following these games long enough, you really should think of them. So when we press this button, we get the clue 448. So I guess that's the number we have to enter. Well, good. All right. Um, let's go ahead and start looking around in here. Okay, so we have a diagram of a circle with another circle inside of it, and the Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, and, well, IV is 4, but they have 4 I's here, plus another one of these things equals a question mark. Well, we've seen these before. They were definitely behind that door in the 9-door room uh, that led to the, uh, the thing with the horn and the levers on it. We weren't really able to experiment with that, but maybe somehow this has to do with that. But we can't open it. There's also uh, like an alarm clock thing here that kind of looks like that broken clock in the entryway in REM 2. I don't know if you guys remember that one or not, but there's like that clock you can just kind of toy around with that does nothing. Maybe Kalos just likes broken clocks that happen to be stuck on 7 o'clock. And here is a device of some sort. It's a device, alright. Nothing under these pillows. And we've got some sort of guide here on the wall that shows block numbers and then a hand-drawn number next to them. 1 equals 6, 2 equals 9, 3 equals 10, and so forth. And none of these really seem to have any sort of rhyme or reason attached to them. But if you look at the number of blocks here on each number, you'll notice that they are equivalent to the number that's written here. Where are we going to use that? Well, we haven't seen anything like that yet, with numbers at least. Let's check out what's over here. It looks like we found the uh, control panel for that clock clue that we saw in the other room. And here is where we pretty much have to set the various numbers. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I don't really have any intention of showing you what all of them are. So I'm just going to go ahead and give the solution away. And this is connected to this little cabinet here. So the first a color that needs to be up here is gray. Then this one needs to be yellow. And then pink. And then aqua, or cyan. Green. And white, or I guess kind of off-white, light gray. Brown, black, orange. And then the final row is blue, purple or fuchsia. And then red. All right, and we got a... Uh, it's like a paper roll. This seems to be the device that we need to put into that uh, room there in the east area. And this clock is ticking here. Huh, wait a second. If we were to follow this wire, where would this go? Okay, it goes right in here. I don't think it's a coincidence that this clock is right here either, so I wonder, what can we do with this? We can grab onto the pendulum, which stops it. So I wonder what happens if we stop it at 7. 
Okay, let's try that out. And we get a mysterious key. I gotta admit, I was kind of expecting something a little bigger considering just how wide this is. Okay, so now that we've gotten that done, I'm gonna go back and, uh, I'm gonna have to go the long way, but I'm gonna go back and switch the airlock so that we've got everything all set up for the other path. There we go. I must say, I like this area of this game a lot. It's... I don't know. I, maybe it's just the fact that it's supposed to be someone's home, even though it doesn't really look like a home. But it feels... I don't know. It feels interesting. Like, the statues make it fun. It doesn't feel quite as... Even though there are machines, it doesn't feel quite as dry and mechanical as some of the other areas. What was that sound? There's a weird clock here. With a plus sign. So what does this do? We can't... Oh. The hand move. So... There's a wire that runs to it. And then goes to this equal sign. And we're supposed to enter a number and then push this. And this clock has apparently three hands. Oh. Oh, okay. So we can pick random numbers. So let's wait for the clocks to change hands again. We can actually see right here the kind of the rhythm that they go in. That this is like a single thing, and then this one goes every other hand that this moves, and this one goes every three. I'm going to wait one more uh, turn here for this thing to go so I can have all the time I need. Okay, so this one, this one, this one. So this is 108, and then 153, I think? Quick mental math, let's see. Yep, got it. You have to be really quick, like right there you just heard that one change. Usually a good strategy for that puzzle is just to wait until you get like a, a, or just keep experimenting with the random number generator until you get something really low that corresponds with where the hands are near at least. That usually helps, but you, I'm pretty good at mental math, so that puzzle is definitely not too bad. But it looks like we're done with many Endis' area, so we can now go off to the east area and see if, what we can do with that paper roll. Speaking of mental math, um, when I was little, there was this set of games I played, like for MS-DOS, you know, back when everything was like on DOS. It was this thing called Mental Math Games, and uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of this or not, but I think it was made by some university, like it wasn't something you just bought in a store. At least I don't think it was. Uh, I'm gonna back up one more. But like they had these different games, and uh, like there was they they were basically all games that tested your speed ability to answer like simple arithmetic problems as fast as you could. Uh, and my favorite one was this one called Raccoon Race. And basically the whole point of Raccoon Race was um, let's close this off first. The whole point of Ra Raccoon Race was to answer a bunch of problems, and depending on how fast you went. This raccoon in this terribly animated 16 color sequence would go through this ridiculous obstacle course through the desert and then underwater and then through a city and then on an airplane and then into a jungle and then a volcano and then a cave and then a, like a bunch of other stuff until he finally got to his like tree house that he called home. And it was so ridiculous. Like I never even beat the whole thing because it was so long and it was tedious to have to go through and um, like do more problems to advance the little animation just a little bit further. The fun thing though was that it used the William Tell Overture as the background music. Like every one of the games used like classical music in some regard as background music and they had some really funny um, piece selections. Like there was this one game that was called like Moon Launch I think and basically you solved math problems and the faster you did it the faster your rocket would get into space, and if you were slow, then the rocket would collapse back down to Earth and kill everyone, I guess. And uh, if you answered them all fast enough, the rocket would get to the moon, and you'd get this little animation of an astronaut just waving at you, saying, hey, you know, we made it. It was kind of cute. Oh, yeah, and the, and the best one, 
Um, well, other than raccoon thing. I, I'm sure, like, if I played this right now, it would just be, like, unbearable because it was so tedious. But my other favorite was this game that was just called Maze. And basically the objective of Maze was that you solved math problems to change directions in the maze. And you couldn't, like, um, take too long or bump into walls or anything or you'll get killed. Anyway, um, here's the puzzle where we need to input that uh, drawing that we saw with the line entering from the northwest and then going down once it hits the middle. And the tricky thing about this, as we uh, saw earlier, was that when you press one button, you affect another one. In this case, whatever's on the left. So if I press this one, it's going to affect this. If I press this, it's going to affect this. So you want to do the far um, right button once, the third button three times, second button once, and first button three times. Now this connects over here to this thing. Alright, and sure enough it does send the rail car back a little bit. So what have we got here? Aha! Looks like we got the final piece of the mold. And another spot where we can put a shape piece. In this case, a circle. Okay, so now that we've got that paper roll, I'm going to go in here and try this out. Now there's a couple of things we need to do here. We can put this in, but nothing happens when we press the buttons. That's because we have to do something on this side. We got the fuse in here, but what we need to do is we need to employ the use of this diagram that we picked up earlier that showed all these um, combinations of um, switches, I guess you can call these, for these circles. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go off of what, combina what uh, position the hand had stopped at when you shut the clock off earlier uh, when you took this fuse out. And in this case, it is 12 o'clock. And you're supposed to stop this over here as well. So, as we noted earlier, you can turn this around. But since we stopped that clock at 12 o'clock, we need to stop this one at 12 o'clock too. And whatever um, branch of this corresponds with that, in this case, this one, is what we set everything else to. That should work. So what about this? Oh, now this is interesting. Oh, we can't go back? Well, what you're supposed to figure out, basically, is that you start off with these numbers. They get fed into the roll, and then somehow they get converted into something else. So let's follow the roll and see what happens here. We start off with 724180, right? So we go down. These parts of the line get cut. And over here, you'll notice that the numbers get grouped by brackets, and then nothing happens here, it seems like, and then the brackets emerge on this side in a completely different spot. So what happens in between? Well, you may recall just a little while ago that when we tried to reverse, a light flashed. And this is how we can tell where the numbers go. I can hold the button down here, and that allows the light to shine even uh, longer. And this is why you actually need the light bulb here in the first place, which is kind of devious. I mean, granted, it does show you that the bulb spot is there. But basically what we got here is that the first number, which is uh, 7, goes all the way to the last spot. And then the second numbers, 2 and 4, go into the uh, second and third spot still, so they remain the same. And then the th um, uh, fourth number goes to the first spot, which is 1. And then the fifth and sixth numbers, 8 and 0, go into the fourth and fifth spots. So the number right now has gone from 724180 to 124807. So let's continue on. This is what we have right now. And it looks like right here, the it's indicating that the... Um, numbers in this part, the middle four, need to rotate. So we had 124807, and now we have 108427. Let's continue on. Okay. So this part right here is the one. This is the eight, uh, excuse me, the 084. 
And then this is the 2 and this is the 7. So let's see where all this goes. The 1 goes at the very end. Um, the 0, 8, 4 um, gets shifted one space. So instead of numbers 2, 3, and 4, it becomes numbers 3, 4, and 5. And then um, the 2 gets moved to the front. So the first number is now 2. And then finally the 7 gets moved to the second number. So we went from 1, 0, 8, 4, 2, 7 to 2, 7, 0, 8, 4, 1. Okay, I hope you guys are tracking with me. So we have another transition here. We now have the 2 in this bracket, the 7, 0 in this bracket, the 8, 4 in this bracket, and the 1 in this bracket. So the 2 gets moved all the way to the end from the beginning. And then the 7, 0 gets moved from positions 2 and 3 to positions 1 and 2. And 8, 4 um, pretty much remains the same. And then finally the 1 gets moved to the third position. So we've gone from 270841 to 701842. So what's next? All right, so groups of three numbers have now been turned around. So we can now go from 701842 to 107248. And that should be the solution. Now this is kind of a little bit deceptive because this kind of makes you think that this corresponds to individual sides of the solution. So, for instance, like this beca began as the left side of the solution, 724, and then that side of the solution became 107, and 180 became 248. And because the left side ends up here on the right side, and the right side ends up on the left side, and you may think you need to reverse them, but actually you don't. Yeah, it's kind of a little bit silly, but you do have to enter them in the basically the right order. Which I kind of prefer, but I wish this wiring wasn't so counterintuitive. But thankfully, we have gotten another fragment. Let's see which one this is. Fragment 8. Alright. Four down, five to go. Now, technically, I could have come here later on to do this. And uh, connect the um, power off to this area that reverses the tram and all that. But I wanted to go here now so I could get that metal piece because we're going to need that on our trip back to the main part of this game. You know, the area south of the railway. So let's go ahead and start heading back that way now. We've done pretty much all we can here for the time being. At this point, all we really need to do is get that uh, circle piece and that tr uh, pentagon piece. I can't really think of anything else that we really need at this point. I, mean, I think we've done everything. So, yeah, I mean, we can pretty much just exit here and just go through this way. Now, there's one loose end here that we've uh, mentioned at the very start of this whole area. We haven't actually looked at it yet. And the reason why is because I didn't really have any use for it until now. I mean, normally I guess a real explorer would have checked this out a long time ago, but this purple button that was originally sitting in front of the tram when it was here, we haven't pushed this yet. Oh. Alright, so it gave us a sequence of lights, and yes, this is another random thing. And you might recall that on the opposite side, we have those pads that we can set the numbers to. So this seems to be the way we can set the code. Now, keep in mind that we have to basically mirror what we saw, because, you know, we're facing the opposite direction now and all that. Um, so let's see, this was like the first one, and then the one over here was the second one. And then we have to go all the way back here for the third one. And then the middle one is the fourth one. And then finally the first one is the fifth one. Voila!